Hey everyone, uh, welcome back to Crafting a Life I Want. My name is Sean, and this little guy is my seven-week-old, just over. And if it's any indication of what we're still dealing with our quarantine, I am in the shop with a seven-week-old. We're not doing anything right now, just doing the introduction to a new video, so don't go, uh, don't go judging me. But I hope everyone out there is staying safe, sane, and healthy. Um, today uh, is an exciting project for me. Over Christmas, I was able to visit my in-laws and uh, the nephew of my mother-in-law's significant other um, ran into me, really uh, liked my YouTube channel when I mentioned it, immediately subscribed, and then offered me to come over to his shed and go through the axes that they weren't using anymore and I could have what I wanted. So I headed over a couple days later and uh, went through and there were a couple axes that I really wanted um, and three or four more that were no names, but uh, he told me to take them all and wouldn't take any money. So I took a quick look at them, and one of them was this uh, genuine Norland camper axe. Um, if you're in the axe community at all, uh, you know that Norlands are fairly uh, sought after. The stamp on this one is pretty clean. I believe this is an original handle, as everything I've found has indicated this style and length of uh, of stick for it um, and you can see there's been a little bit of welding on the top so we'll have a have a little bit of work to do for it but the axe itself is in great shape the welds didn't go too deep and so I'm pretty sure we can fix that up uh, relatively easily in fact uh, once I got it sorry about you move that down uh, once I got it all I did was uh, hit the bottom of it a couple times to reseat the head and that broke the weld off on that washer that was on top um, I'm not going to be putting it back on a straight stick. I don't like the look of them very much, so I'm going to be putting it on a nice uh, thin bendy stick. And I'm going to try something new on this one. I went ahead and glued together uh, some white ash and black walnut that you can see here. And we're going to put it on a 24 inch stick that's going to be made out of this. What's up, buddy? What's up? We don't necessarily like being on camera, but look, you're so cute. Um, and so I've got a pattern for that. Uh, I'll show you kind of the process. So I went through making that real quick, and then we'll get started with uh, taking the head off and getting it cleaned up. So uh, thank you for joining. If you haven't already, uh, please like and subscribe below, and we'll get started on this. Yeah. Can we say hi? Hi. The design process was fairly simple. I started with just drawing up a uh, two scale version of the original stick, which you see on the right, decided I didn't like that and shifted to the bendy stick you see in the middle uh, with the accented Fawn's foot. I then uh, converted that to a full size drawing on paper and then transferred that to the white ash, which was a terrible idea since after glue up that drawing wasn't visible at all. But fortunately I still have the paper pattern so I can just transfer that to the uh, black walnut once we get this all glued up and squared away again. So I use Tight Bond 3 for this application since it's their waterproof wood glue. Spread it on liberally, then go ahead and put it together and clamp it really well. In the time it took me, and this was maybe a day uh, between when I planed the black walnut to dimension, it had worked just by being in my temperature controlled house. So I use a lot of clamps just to make sure we're getting a good bond between the glue and the three pieces of wood. It shouldn't be that big of an issue, but I probably use twice as many clamps as I would typically just because of that slight warp. So the next day I pop off the clamps and off camera I take it over and clean up all of the edges um, on the planer and on my grinder.
right, so the handle came out of that head really easily. I uh, take it straight over to the uh, drill press. It's got a wire wheel on it and take care of all the surface rust. And then the next step is going to be filing off as much as I can of those weld marks around the eye. Uh, the pull is a little rough, um, so I'll take care of that on the grinder a little later. Since that welding uh, caused the metal around the eye to harden greater than my file, I just take it to a ceramic belt on my grinder and take care of it there. So I'm really happy with how the angles turned out up here. Obviously this is still pretty rough. Um, it's a 120 grit or an 80 grit belt I was using on that so you can see all the grind marks in it uh, The pole is still a little rough as well. I did a little work there, but I have to go back and take some more off But wanted to give you an, a view of what it looks like at this point While I'm working on the pole I decided to carry some of the angles from the top that I had to put in over to the edges of the pole and just make it a little geometric and I'm again really happy with how it turned out. The corners ended up nice and crisp on those angles and I look forward to how it's going to look once I move up in grits and get it get it to a set and finish. That belt you see in the background is a very fine uh, surface conditioning belt from Combat Abrasives, and I'm really happy with the finish I got out of it. I took the head up to a 220 grit and then finished it on the surface conditioning belt, and it looks fantastic. What you're seeing here is the bottom side of the eye. I like to chamfer the edges here because if you leave them sharp as the handle is going in, rather than compressing the wood, it will peel up the fibers and I'd much rather have the wood compressing as it goes into the eye. Now that my son has protected us from the trolls, um, a drill knife is by far one of the best tools to use for uh, shaping an eye. And I, I, I'm no exception. I love my draw knife. I do some fine tuning with a couple different rasps once we get it down, but the bulk of the material removal is done with the draw knife.
So now the head is sitting well on this handle and it is time to put this handle on a diet. There's still way too much wood here and it's really got to be narrowed down a significant amount before it's going to be uh, feeling much more comfortable in the hand. With the head fitting well, I move on to some of my more aggressive rasps, like a farrier's rasp, to shape the profile of the handle. Once that's done, I'm going to move on to actually narrowing it down a good deal and establishing the shape that I want. I decided to do a more hybrid handle shape with this one where the back side is going to be faceted like an octagonal handle and the front side is going to be curved to like a teardrop shape, which I have found really comfortable when I'm using it. That Stanley 151 spoke shape is one of my favorite tools for establishing facets on wooden handles. I used it to uh, narrow out this handle as well as establish the facets on the backhand section. Now that the majority of the handle is completed, I'm going to move forward with cutting the kerf and hanging the head. everyone, welcome back to the shop. I'm now at a stage where I am ready to hang the head on the handle. I'm sure you noticed that I only finished about 75% of the handle and that's for a very specific reason. Uh, if you remember, my design had a very narrow section here at the palm swell at the end and so I left that flat and chunky so that it'd give me something to hammer on to allow that head to seat nicely on the handle. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that now, and then I will uh, come back and re-finish shaping the back half of this handle and finish it up. So one of the first things you wanna do is to get your wedge situated for your ax. And I like to do that off, off the handle entirely. I wanna make sure that my wedge fits in easily down to the section that I want it to. 
I also made measurements both for the kerf I cut as well as how deep that kerf goes and marked that on my wedge so that I know at the point that I'm bottoming out the wedge and not to go any further. And then other than that, I'm just set up. I have, I'll show you uh, once we get going, but I have an, uh, a railroad track down here. I like having a piece of solid metal to hammer on to seat the wedge. It gives me a nice flat section and I'll show you how to do that here in just a second. Um, but the order of operations for this is going to be uh, put the head on the handle, seat it with my uh, rubber hammer. This is not the best thing to use. I'd rather have a dead blow hammer, but this works pretty well without marring up the wood. Once it's seated, I'll go ahead and put a thin coat of glue on the wedge. I like uh, to use glue, some people don't. I, this gives me a little more security on um, axes that are going to be users. Not that this one is, I just got in the habit of doing it. And then uh, we'll start the wedge, uh, hammer it in a little ways, and then we're gonna use the uh, railroad piece that I have down here and another hammer to really seat that wedge in nicely. So I'm gonna go ahead and get the camera set up to show you that and we'll get that done. Aesthetically, I tend to prefer to leave my handles proud, but due to that filler piece breaking off where it did uh, and my inability to get it out, I needed to go back in and end up flush cutting this one. There's no problem with doing that. It'll still uh, stay on just fine. I just, like I said, I aesthetically prefer the way a slightly proud handle looks. With the shaping of the handle complete, I bring the entire surface up to 220 grit. From here, I'm ready to start applying boiled linseed oil. This is my favorite step of any woodworking project, as applying the oil brings out the character of any wood, but in this case, the stark contrast between the black walnut and the white ash is particularly stunning. I'll continue to apply coats of boiled linseed oil once a day for the next week, hitting it with 400 grit in between just to uh, flatten out any grain that gets raised with the oil. This axe restoration was a lot of fun. I learned a lot along the way, and hopefully I was able to teach some of you all some things as well. Uh, if nothing else, a way to uh, hopefully limit you making some of the same mistakes I did. This axe is destined back to New Hampshire to one of my subscribers who gifted me this axe as well as four or five others when I was home at last Christmas, so I really hope he appreciates it. Again, thank you for watching. If you haven't already, please like and subscribe. Additionally, I did do a good deal of redesign for the channel, and these designs are now available on t-shirts as well as other things. If you go ahead and click the link in the description, you'll be directed to my Teespring page where you can see all of the designs that are available as well as purchase them. 
Uh, we don't make a ton of money off of it, and any money we do make just goes back into the channel for supplies, tools, etc., just to allow me to make better videos for you all to um, view. So again, thanks for watching, and I hope you'll come along for the next one.